Welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast with Stuart Fensterheim, LCSW, your source for the latest tips and practical down-to-earth advice on creating emotionally connected, thriving relationships. Now, here's Stuart. Hi there, and welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast. This is Stuart Fensterheim, the Couples Expert. I am so pleased to have all of you back here again today. You know, they say... Love is a guessing game. And what I know as an emotionally focused therapist is that is not true. There is definitely a map for helping people have close, connected relationship. But what about love? Is love something that just happens? Or is it way too difficult and not able to put our fingers on it? I am having on my show today a gentleman by the name of Dr. Arthur Aaron. Dr. Aaron is a psychologist at Stony Brook, and one of the things that he created or came across with his research and studies was a questionnaire for helping couples develop a closeness and a deepening of the feelings that they have for one another. And there have been a number of people who've taken these questionnaires and have found a love that is deep, connected, and strong. What I want to do today is talk with Dr. Aaron about that, but talk about it in a different kind of way. Let's find out in terms of the research what he has found that would help couples develop a relationship that has the possibility more than most of maintaining a relationship that you feel confident and feel like you're in this relationship forever. And we're going to see what he's learned about love, relationships, and developing a deepening of the love. But who is Dr. Aaron, and why is he someone that we should listen to? Dr. Aaron is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York, SUNY, at Stony Brook. He's best known for his work on intimacy and interpersonal relationship and developed a model of motivation in close relationships. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology and philosophy in 1967 and a master's degree in 1968, both of them from the University of California, Berkeley. He also has a doctorate, which he received from the University of Toronto in 1970. His work primarily focuses on friendship, intimacy, and developing a model that we're talking about today on establishing a close relationship. Dr. Aaron is married to the love of his life, and he has been married since 1968. His wife is Elaine Aaron, and some of you may know Elaine through her work with highly sensitive person theoretical model. We might talk a little bit about his relationship with Elaine to see if it relates at all to the research that he's done. But I'm really excited to get to know Dr. Aaron better. And after reading some of his research and material, I am so thrilled, Dr. Aaron, to have you on the Couples Expert Podcast. Welcome to my show. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, one of the first questions I like to ask the folks that come on my show is a little bit about you, a little bit about your path to becoming a psychologist, why you decided to come go into that field in particular, and in particular, why the love area? I was uh, graduate. I was undergraduate, studying, majoring in philosophy, and I became very interested in philosophy of science. And in doing so, I realized that the most interesting science to study the philosophy of was psychology. And so I was a double major in psychology. And in the process, I got pulled into psychology, particularly social psychology. Um, so I went to graduate school in social psychology, and Along the way, I fell very intensely in love. Now, with Elaine Aaron, my my longtime partner, um, when I was back in those days, and still to some extent, sort of when you were studying social psychology, the culture was find a topic that people thought couldn't be studied scientifically and do it. And I fell intensely in love. I looked around to see what the research was, and there was very little. There was a few, but not much on it. And I said, here's my topic. And that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years. 
You know, it's interesting as an emotionally focused therapies, the theoretical model that I follow with my couples counseling, and I'm sure you're aware a bit at least of Sue Johnson's work. One of the things that she's talked about in the hold me tight material that she has done is that, that she was shunned actually when she first started researching some of this to even try to put some sort of a model together about love because people believed love was just sort of a by chance thing and that we now know that it can be validated by research. And you were even doing that before then. Oh, yes. In fact, the two real pioneers in our field, Elaine Hatfield and Ellen Bershide, back in the late 60s, got a national U.S. National Science Foundation grant to study love, and they were awarded a Golden Fleece Award, the first one from the senator at that time, who was thought this was a total waste of government money. Um, no, it's been a difficult thing, uh, and yet the field has now increasingly come to accept it, in part because our research has been so thorough and systematic, especially since we started doing brain imaging studies. How does the brain, talk a little bit about the brain imaging when it comes to this, because I've seen some studies recently, which, which include MRI studies on love and connection. And how does the brain imaging, how does that differ than something like an MRI? Well, that's what we're basically doing. Uh, my research that has used brain imaging has been entirely fMRI. And uh, there is a little bit of work using some other methods, but fMRI still is sort of the gold standard. And what we found very consistently is looking at people who are newly in love when they think about or look at a picture of the person they're in love with, uh, there is activation in the uh, dopamine reward area, same area that responds to cocaine. Um, and, uh, one of the, and what that permitted us to do is a number of things. Uh, one thing is it allowed us to compare intense romantic love cross-culturally. Because if you just ask people, the language they have, the attitudes they have about it are very different. But if you look at their brains, you can see the similarities. And we're getting the same response when we did it, for example, in China. The other thing it permitted us to do most recently, which I think will interest your listeners particularly, is we were able to look at people who were together 20, 30, 40 years who claimed to be very intensely in love. Um, and we interviewed them. And sure enough, these people seemed like they were very intensely in love. Um, so we put them in the scanner. Were they just kidding themselves or kidding us? And what we saw in their brain looked very much like the people who would just fallen in love. Now, there aren't a lot of such people. Um, but the fact it can happen at all uh, is quite striking. Now, a lot of people don't want to hear this. Uh, as you probably know, uh, some of the nice research that's been done by Paul von Lange and Carol Russell and others suggests that one of the ways couples feel good about themselves is by comparing to other couples. You know, oh, look how they always argue at the party. But, <laughs> um, but you know, on the other hand, this is a reminder that it is possible. And you don't have to just assume that being in an okay relationship is the best you can do. Right. And one of the things that I talk a lot about in my practice is, is okay is about survival. Uh, if you really want to live your life and have a life that really has some substance and significance, you have to have a connection that's more than just okay. It has to be one that is authentic and vulnerable, where you really know that you're important to your partner. It's really central uh, to your well-being and to your health. Uh, the research shows that uh, the quality of your close relationships play a bigger role in your general well-being uh, and happiness than any other factor. And uh, also, they're, the big, they're a huge predictor of how long you'll live in physical health, as big a predictor as uh, uh, smoking or obesity. You know, uh, it's exciting to hear you say some of this, because for me, I've always believed that, and the theoretical model of emotionally focused therapy says that very clearly validated by the research that they've done. But to have it really be shown in different forms of research over and over and over again, how could you not even, how could you dis 
prove that or how could you disbelieve it because it's been proved over so many times and, and to get people sometimes to really understand that it's worth that energy and effort to really feel something more than just it's a nice relationship is sometimes difficult for, for us in this field. And one of the things you and I were talking about before we went on air here is a little bit about the research that you did. And, and, and I was calling it a quiz earlier. And you were clarifying that for me. So I'd like you to talk about that to make sure that this audience understands what it is and what's exciting about what you've done. Well, the research that has in the last year or two gotten so much attention has been these so-called 36 questions that we developed to create closeness between any two pairs of strangers. There was a New York Times article, a very lovely written one, where uh, the author used this to fall in love with someone. The way it works is there are 36 questions. They, you ask each other, two people sit together and the beginning questions are relatively superficial and they get increasingly personal. And uh, she found that when she did this with this person, they fell in love. And the what went viral was the notion that any two people could do this who want to and could fall in love. Well, that might be the case, but we haven't tested it for that. Uh, we developed it as so a, it's not a pickup thing if you go into a bar you're not going to use this to well you you could it would get you close it would probably get you close to the person if you did it but it might not make you fall in love right <laughs> okay go ahead sorry <laughs> no no i mean it, it is a way to connect with someone and not just a romantic person it's a great way to connect with someone you'd like to be a friend with um but we basically developed it as a laboratory procedure um we want to be able to test systematically what is the effect of being close to someone. And if you just bring in, say, pairs of friends versus strangers, the friends have a whole different history and chose each other. This way we can bring in any two people, randomly assign them to either get close or not, and then put them in the scanner or measure their hormones or measure their behavior or their attitudes, whatever. And so that's what we developed it for. But it has been used. Uh, in some applied settings, including in some interesting romantic settings, but not so much to make people fall in love, but to strengthen love in long-term relationships. What we found, uh, this is some great research we did with Rich Slatcher, is if we take two couples, now, you know, two married couples, the couples may not know each other or just know each other a little, and they do these 36 questions as a foursome. So each of the four answers question one, goes on to question two. And at the end of the hour or so, they are not only closer to the other couple, which is a good thing for relationships, a lot of research on that, but they are closer to their own partner and it even increases passionate love for your own partner. That's a really fascinating comment, the last one especially, about passion. Yeah. Well, one of the ways it does it, I mean, you... Self-disclosure, revealing things, um, is part of the formation of closeness, developing closeness. When it happens rapidly, it creates a sense of passion. But it turns out it's not so much self-disclosure as the responsiveness of the other person. When two people, are, and I'm sure you know this from your work uh, with emotion-focused therapy, when two people hear each other, when they're responsive to each other, that really strengthens their feelings for each other. And when that happens rapidly, it creates a sense of passion. How does the responsiveness fit with this? Because if I ask you a question, and there's a lot of ways you might address the question I ask you, I could say, okay, what is, like one of the questions you have in here is, what do you value most in a friendship? You could say, you could answer it in a two-word sentence, or you can answer it in, you know, two paragraphs. How and responsiveness to for each individual, I think, is very different. So how do you sort of put that into a form where people are responding to the questions in the way that you need them to? We basically lucked out when we did this initial research. We did not know the importance of responsiveness. We were focusing on self-disclosure. 
What we're now learning from other people who are using our method and assessing it is that what matters is not how much you self-disclose, but how responsive the other person is. But it turns out that by gradually escalating, we start out with very superficial questions, uh, but towards the, you know, what did you get for Christmas last year? But towards the end, they get very personal. How would you feel if your mother died? You know, um, and what tends to happen is since each of you are answering the questions, or all four of you, if it's two couples, um, you're being answered, you're answering the others, it's developing gradually, so you're comfortable with getting close to the person. Um, it turns out people are responsive, not always, but typically. And the degree to which they're responsive does predict how close they get, but it works for most people. Uh, if we were developing this today, we would work more carefully to emphasize the responsiveness aspect of it. What's really exciting about what what you're talking about, it has so many different applications because when I talk to couples who have, let's say they talk about sort of meeting somewhere and having this incredible intense relationship very, very fast and then they make the decision to either move in together or, or get married and then they wonder why after being together a period of time they're pulling away – there is a suggestion in just the format that you just described of needing time to learn to get to so know someone before you make the long-term commitment. The buildup that you were just talking about works because you, you're getting to know someone gradually with these questions. Well, it, it certainly works for building a sense of closeness. Right. Uh, we haven't tested the extent to which it predicts how well the relationship will develop over time. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly seems reasonable that would be the case. Um, but as you know, uh, and, and certainly the research is very clear, um, what predicts how well a relationship works doesn't have as much to do with the match between the people as it does with their own security and, and uh and lack of anxiety and depression with the, you know, the support of their friends and family with how much stress they're under. Um, you know, if those things are in place, you know, if they can communicate reasonably well and handle conflict, almost any two people can get along, uh, you know, except for extremes. Obviously, right. if you speak different languages or one of you is seven and one of you is 40, you know, <laughs> right. but except for extremes, um, it's not so much the match. It's, it's how people, uh, you know, the circumstance. And then there's the things, as, as you like to emphasize, that people can do to go beyond it just being okay. And something like developing strong linkages with other couples uh, is definitely one of them. Um, and I think what happens, what we argue from our model, is that a huge motivation in life, the creation of passion, is this rapid, we call expansion of the self. And when you fall in love with someone and develop a relationship, you include them in the self. They become part of you, as does the relationship. And that rapid expansion is very passionate, very exciting. But eventually you get to know them and you may enjoy being with them. And they're, But it, that passion slows down. So what do you do then? And that's where it's important to start doing things and beyond just making it okay. And it's although that's crucial because it's not OK, it's not going to work. And um, a lot of our research is on what to do then and um, doing this with another couple is one thing. But the biggest part of our research is couples at that point um, should really spend the time to do something exciting with their partner on a regular basis. So um, something novel, something challenging. And the notion is that here you're going to have this excitement. You're doing it with your partner. So you associate it with the relationship. So we've done a lot of studies where we ask people once a week to do something different, something novel, something challenging, nothing that's overwhelming. If it's too stressful, it won't work. Um, and then uh, we follow them. And uh, one study that just came out from another lab found that four months later, these people were much more in love and happy. We've got uh, done a lot of lab studies of it. Um, <laughs> my wife and I uh, try to do it regularly. Um, so this notion of trying, you know, at least once a week or so to do something novel, challenging with your partner really can reinvigorate 
that sense of, of passion. And there's a few other things that are coming out in some recent research. Um, one of my favorites is this work by uh, Harry Reese and Shelley Gable on celebrating your partner's successes. Um, we haven't done this in our lab, but it's some of my favorite work. Uh, and that is when something good happens with your partner, you know, they get a promotion or, or just some little thing happens. They find something they lost they were really looking for. To the extent you can celebrate that without being patronizing, it really uh, is, you know, is good for the relationship. You mentioned my wife who studies the highly sensitive person. Uh, we both of us, I, I collaborate with her and she on that research and she collaborates with me on the relationship research, which for us is a novel and exciting thing to do. <laughs> but, um, but I know that uh, she had submitted a paper uh, to a, a very major journal, uh, a major review, biologically based review of the highly sensitive person research a couple of years ago. And uh, it was a top journal. We thought the chances of her getting it accepted were not very good. Uh, and I was home when the uh, email came in uh, saying not only been accepted, but the editor just loved it. and They were going to publish it. And uh, I had just read this research on celebrating your partner's successes. So I made a poster of that email and put it on the front door. <laughs> we had a wonderful night. But it's those kind of, you know, that was an extreme example. But anytime you can celebrate your partner's successes, it's really it turns out it has a bigger positive effect than supporting your partner when things go badly. The celebration, yeah. Well, again, you don't want to over the top, you know, you don't want to, you know, they have some little thing happen and you just go way over it, kind of patronizing. But. Right. No, I'm talking about true celebrating because true, yeah. uh, what, what, it, what I talk about it as is that if you have a fun, exciting experience and it's with your partner, you define that I have – the most fun in my life with this individual, why would I want to be with anyone else? <laughs> and that's really what you're talking about. Yeah, well, not only why would you not want to be with it, why would you want to be with anyone else, but just it's wonderful to be with this person. Right, it feels good. Yeah. It yeah. just feels good. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you and, might want to be with someone else too. You might want to be with your son or daughter or with, you know, other people, but you really enjoy being with this person. Right, because the excitement is better, if from my perspective, the excitement is better when it's with this person than with anyone else. But yes, it just feels good also. Yeah, and you want to be with this person. Right. Uh, and we, we haven't, you know, whether it's compared to anyone else, obviously, if you're in a monogamous relationship, um, you know, being good with this person means that you prefer them over any other, you know, romantic relationship. Right. Uh, but you still might want to have wonderful relationships of other kinds with friends and family and so forth. And we don't want to minimize the comment you made a moment ago, which some people may not understand as much as I might because I grew up in a family of educators. My stepdad is a professor of history, and my mom is, uh, for years was an educator, a vice principal at, at schools. The intellectual connection and the excitement of producing an article or a piece of printed work – or a, an experiment that you, you, you write the lab results from and it being published, there's nothing more exciting than that. Well, yeah, they, they, it's certainly a celebration. Probably for us, the most exciting, actually, is when we conducted a study, a, a brain imaging study or a, even a big survey, all the data come in. And then we're sitting there together analyzing the data. Did it work? <laughs> And when you run those analyses and they come out, it worked. I mean, sometimes it comes out the other way, <laughs> but right. when it comes out at work. That's really exciting. You're in the room with the tiger when you're analyzing data. Oh, I know. And, and you know, not everyone is going to understand that. No, I understand. <laughs> but it's what works for us. But, uh, right. For and and, and also, it what makes your relationship unique and special. Yeah, but we do other things, too. I mean, uh, summer before last, we went rafting down the uh, – Colorado and the Grand Canyon, you know, <laughs> we, we try to do different kinds of things. This, this weekend, we're going to take our grandson to a horse race. We haven't been to a horse race in years, you know, things that are new and different. Right. And, and, and I also like to tell couples that it doesn't have to be that different. It just has to be something different than what you normally do, which is where the whole date night concept comes in and, you know, taking 
time aside just for the two of you, devoted for your relationship and doing something that you both enjoy and it's different than what you normally do every other day? Yeah, our, our, the data we have suggests that both are important, that it be something you'll enjoy and, and certainly not overly stressful, uh, but also new. Doing the same old, same old, even if it's enjoyable, does not have anywhere near the same effect. Right. And most people wait. It's interesting because I just did a podcast with someone and it was about you don't have to wait for the weekends to sort of do something fun. And and part of what my wife and I do is we, and a lot of people look to vacations for this. But I think it's too long in between is what you're saying, is that we need to do it all the time is like zip lining or doing something that's totally different than what you normally would do. That's what's important. Yeah, and, and on a fairly regular basis. My, my wife and I, uh, you know, love to go see plays. And one night, uh, which we do all the time, although plays and movies are kind of interesting because you're getting engaged in something new and exciting sometimes. But one night we were walking back from a play in Manhattan, and uh, we walked by a bar and said, you know, we haven't hung out in a bar in years and years. Let's just go hang out. And that was fun and different. Right. Um, and and so many people don't do and Music does it for us, too. I think music just has so many levels to it. Oh, um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the staying in love. We have this of building the passion and building it. I wonder how your uh, your research has shown about couples who are together for a long time. And you did mention about, you know, doing things. But are there any tips that you can give couples through your research of how to keep the passion alive and how to really have a relationship where you could feel confident that you two are going to be together forever? Well, I would say from looking at my own research and the, and the larger body of research that, of course, you do have to attend first to being sure you're not overwhelmed by the problems. Right. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, and external stressors are a huge one that, that's hard to do much about. Uh, but also, you know, things like uh, making sure you've got good relationships with your in-laws and your family and, and, and things like uh, children. Uh, it, yeah. And if either of you are anxious or depressed or insecure, you know, probably the biggest thing you can do is work on yourself. People don't want to hear that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but presuming, you know, those and, and then there's communication skills, which are a huge factor. Presuming those things are reasonably in place, um, you know, then what can you do to get beyond it just being OK? And there, I think uh, we don't know as much. We know it's possible. And. One of the things is doing exciting things together. We have a lot of evidence that that helps. Um, but there's not much else. There's, you know, starting to be this research on celebrating your partner's successes. And there's some work on, uh, well, like doing this uh, 36 questions together, you know, being, uh, do, again, in part that's because it's novel and different, but in part it's because it's, uh, that's another line of research, strengthening friendships with other couples. Uh, also, there's some evidence that uh, both from uh, 36 question research and more generally, um, remembering to show gratitude. Um, these are pretty much all we know at this point um, of what can be done. But those things seem to matter a lot. Um, one national U.S. national survey we did a couple years ago, uh, something like 40 percent of the respondents claim to be very intensely in love with their partner, people who've been married 10 years or longer. Um, now, of course, those are the ones still together. Right. Uh, so it's probably not 40% of <laughs> people who get married. But uh, still, um, that was impressive. Now, of course, what they mean by very intensely in love, we don't know. And uh, we're hoping to get some funding to do a more thorough study of that. Um, we do have the fMRI study that shows us that it's possible to be very intensely in love. Um, you know, physical things also seem to matter, like the quality of your sex life and, and not even just sex life, but just kissing and hugging and, and physical connection. The, to the affection. The affection, the physical affection, as right. well as the emotional, of course. See, for me, when I think of it, I think of it in terms of authenticity. That if I really have a good sense 
a, more than just words, a, a experience with my partner that I can be who I am, the good, the bad, the ugly, and know that my partner is truly there for me, loves me in spite of that, and even sometimes because of the things that I don't even like about myself, I can then, if, so it goes to your comment earlier about security, the security that your partner truly is there, and that if you have that kind of a relationship, having it last and working through anything that might have come up is what's going to keep you together. Well, it certainly helps. One of the things that's been found is that insecure people, people and people with low self-esteem, even when they have a partner who loves and trusts and respects them, they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people with high self-esteem and a lot of security sometimes can think their partner cares for them more than they do. Um, but <laughs> Although the, I might go to calling that narcissistic, but that's well, uh, <laughs> uh, beyond a certain point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. How do you think your research and what you've done has impacted your relationship with your wife? Oh, dramatically. We, as I was saying earlier, we, everything, when we do studies, when we read studies, we take advantage of them in our own life. Uh, we very explicitly do that, uh, both to sort of test them, but also because we want as good a relationship as possible. We're doing pretty well. And it doesn't mean that you don't sometimes get triggered, right? What do you mean by triggered? Someone doing something that then flares you up and takes you to a place where you get really upset with your partner. No, no, that's never happened. (laughs) (laughs) Is she around? (laughs) I might have to ask. No, I know. I'm kidding. You know, because I think what happens with those, what, what I call as an emotionally focused therapist triggers which are those interpretations that take you to a really negative place. And what I like to talk about it as you get, you have tokens in the bank, which means Mm -hmm. that if you have all of these things happening, the experiences that you were talking about, the rituals, the new experiences, the disclosure, and someone does something that has you feel like they don't care because that's the emotional place you're at, you're able to have enough memory bank going to say, but what about yesterday? They did all of these good things. We had all this fun. I may be misinterpreting what's happening and giving you and your partner the ability to then repair it. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, I, it reminds me of the research on uh, the effect of being under stressors. When people are under stressors, they have a really hard time doing that. Mm-hmm. In fact, they behave badly because of the stress. And if the partner is also under stress, they behave badly in interpreting it. and Things can just get out of hand uh, because you don't have that memory bank available when you're under great stress, right. even if it's there. And I think the other dimension that we know is that when people feel disconnected, and these are in relationships and not necessarily secure, that fear of not having a connection brings people into that place of primal panic and then how people react to each other can just take you to an extreme place because feeling like you're you're going to be alone for some folks is just so devastating for some folks it'd be good if they could get out of the relationship but well right i mean you know you have to look at that as well of course but um you know, I really appreciate all the insight and, and all the input. And one of the things when I looked at, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask one question of you, which is when I looked at some of the questions, there was one piece in here, and I believe it was a four-minute stare. Is that correct? Um, not Yes and no. That is not part of the standard, uh, what we call a closeness procedure, a fast friends procedure is our actual name for it. Um, it is part of a more intense procedure we used in another study um, that uh, we have not validated very much. It was part of a whole series of things to create, a, a, in this case, was to create a sense of romantic closeness, not necessarily falling in love. Um, and it was part of it. There is some old research uh showing that couples who are in love, if you have them have a conversation or while they're waiting for the next phase of the study, you video them and you measure 
how much time they spent looking in each other's eyes. Couples who are in love spend more time looking in each other's eyes than those who aren't in love or not as much in love. But we have not validated it. But that the New York Times article threw that in for, I, I, I sort of know the history of how that got thrown in, but it's not actually part of the standard procedure. I wouldn't think it would hurt. Right. And, and, and then when I look closer at it, it, it's really about taking, because I think what you just talked about was in terms of the staring, for me, that would be sort of the comfort you have with someone, that if you can sort of stare at them and look at them and you do that, you just feel it's all sort of a natural kind of thing. The other is how much time you take to talk about your life story, because that's what I was just seeing. It says, take four minutes and tell your partner your life story in as much detail as possible. To me, that's about how inclusive and how much energy you're going to put into giving someone that part of you, possibly yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's the, again, your sense of how responsive the partner is, how much they understand, how much they validate what you have to say, how much they care about you. So when you're doing that, you're sort of looking for their response. So what you're saying really is goes right to the heart for for me, which is I tell people all the time, there's really three areas to know if your relationship is strong. Is Are you accessible? The second one, which you've talked a tremendous amount about, which are you responsive? And then do you engage with your partner? So if you have those three qualities, you can be pretty feeling pretty good that your relationship's in a good place. Sounds right. <laughs> so I want to thank you again for coming on and sharing your study and sharing a bit about what we've learned, because I think all it's going to do is help my audience really understand, number one, that love is real and possible. You can have a love that is filled with a life of, of wonderfulness and feeling important to your partner, and that we all have that in us and we all need that. And as long as we are, can be as responsive as we can to our partners, we can feel pretty good that our life's in good place. I thank you for emphasizing those things. And thank you for doing these podcasts. What you're doing is bringing to the world something so important to help their, not just for me, but from all your podcasts to help people strengthen this really central part of their lives. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. Thank you, Art. And we'll talk to all of you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode with your host, Stuart Fensterheim. You're one step closer to reigniting that fiery passion with your partner. For more information and your 30-minute free phone consultation with Stuart, visit www.thecouplesexpertscottsdale.com. We'll see you next time.